Welcome everyone to the Adversity to Advantage podcast. I'm very excited to have been introduced, so we don't really know each other, but I've been introduced to Dorothy Melanda, who's here to tell us her story and what she's passionate about. Uh, Dorothy, give our listeners uh, a little bit of insight into you. What do you do? What are you passionate about? My name's Dorothy Melanda, as you've heard. I am in the nursing profession for the last 33 years. And I am passionate about supporting people who are going through grief and loss or difficult times because I've been there. Amazing. So the nursing profession for years and years, I mean, that is an intense profession. Has that been here in the UK or where have you been? I started it in Kenya. That's where I did my training as a nurse and as a midwife. And then I came qualified in 1989 and then I came to UK in 2002 and so I'm still in the nursing field but I just work from a different specialty to another. You you keep changing. Now I've heard the phrase because I'm a psychotherapist and sometimes we use the phrase compassion fatigue you know have you heard that one? I have. Yes. Do, do, Do you think it shows up in the nursing profession that kind of you know, it feels like a, maybe a heaviness or that nurses get burnt out. Yeah, I think it does with the current environment we work in. It is possible for people to get into that. And that's why we say that we need to get a way of, of loading so that we're just not having it and doing nothing. We need to get ways to distress and to, to be able to to get the average, you know, like... To cope. <laughs> to be in the middle, not to go overboard and also to ask for help because sometimes it's also that bit of not wanting to ask for help or not owning yeah. up saying this is too much for me because many people are afraid to say no. It's com- oh my, I, I relate to this, yeah. Um, why do you think it's so hard for us to, to say that we need help when we are helpers, you know? I think one thing is the work pressure. Possibly you look at whoever you need to ask for and you think they even have more than you do. Mm. And also part of it is when we are empathetic and then we forget to put the limits. So when we don't have that limits, it means even when we go home, we are still going on with the past with everybody's load, which we cannot carry without consequences. No, but how do you know when you've reached your limits? For you personally, how do you know when you're like, oh, I need to be careful now or, or this is going becoming too much? Um, I think I would say I was privileged to have read the book, The Know Your Strength, okay. which was talking about being responsible, um, the five signature themes that it was giving you when you do the profile. Mm. So what it helped me to achieve was the fact that it said people who have responsibility as a strong trait, you seem to be given so much because people depend on you and know that once they give it to you, it is going to be done. And then I realized through that, I was able to see that that was my trait, not only at work, but also outside. So it helped me to know that you can also start delegating, start getting others, equipping others so that you are not the only one who is able to do that particular thing. And that in itself, with the fact that I now learned to say no, made a big difference. That's a hard one though, isn't it? Yeah. So it's like the hardest one, when we because we, we get fulfillment from giving. You, you've gone into the nursing profession. I used to work in youth work, young offenders, and then the charity, mental health. I work in mental health. So I enjoy giving. And then yeah. it's over, sometimes it's over years, isn't it? That it starts yeah. like for a year, two, three, maybe even 10 years, you're good. You can give, 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 give. And then you start feeling maybe physical symptoms or even mental health symptoms, anxiety, depression, right? And, yeah. um, and then suddenly we go, oh, I need to learn to say no, right? Yeah. Well, res- respect for being in the nursing profession as long as you have. Um, so, so Dorothy, give us a little bit of insight into what was what was your childhood like? Um, do, do, do you think you always wanted to be a nurse? Like, what was the environment like for you growing up? 
to be honest, my childhood um, didn't really that that going to nursing. When I grew up, my passion was to go into teaching. <laughs> was it okay? You grew up in Kenya. Yeah, sorry. Did you grow up in Kenya? Is that where yes. you're from? Yes, yeah. I was born in Kenya. I went to school in Kenya, and um, I actually chose teacher training college. Okay. But then somehow along the way, I only visited a friend once on one occasion when she was sick in hospital, and I just felt the work they did was quite amazing. So on that one occasion, I just um, got introduced into the nursing profession, and then my invitation for the teacher training came six months into the nursing profession. Oh. So I thought, I'll see, I'll see, and I'm still seeing up to now. <laughs> okay, I'm still seeing. What do you think it was about that one visit or experience that made you think, maybe, maybe this is, I should pr uh, proceed with this? One thing about it, it was just the way they, I just felt these people were vulnerable and needed help at their lowest time. And the fact that this nurse had given good care and everybody seemed happy about it in the room, they would discuss how it has made a difference to them. So I thought, um, I will go, when I went in, I thought I'll start it and see how it goes and probably revert to my teaching at some point. <laughs> uh, this was just, you were checking it out and the teaching was always the backup plan. Yeah. Um, other than that, my background as a child, I was privileged to grow, to be born when my father was in his good days and he was successful. He was a an inspector of police by then, so we were on a high level. Mm -hmm. But then that changed when my father now became alcoholic, so the job was stopped. And that consequently meant my siblings and I could not go for any education because in Kenya you pay for the education. So that sort of cut our hopes. But that was not all. The first siblings didn't make it beyond primary school. Then... When you say they, didn't make it, what do you mean? They, I, I mean, they didn't proceed to secondary school because of school fees. And how old were you when your fathers kind of switched from, from being very successful to, to being an alcoholic in that way? I remember vividly him being successful and us going places. And then the last now, when I catch up with the most traumatic time is when now in the, in the transition time, he got somebody and he had like a second wife and lived somewhere else. But then when the job stopped, so he went there. But I remember either it could have been on 24th or 25th of December that this woman appeared at our home with my dad and said to my mother, your husband is mad. I don't need him more. And that was it. Our world fell apart. So she up. left and my father stayed with us. Practically, we didn't really know much. I was about 10. Okay. So I didn't know much what that meant in practical terms. No. But then eventually now I started grasping because there were times he would, he would turn up and he's not in good mood. He would turn up and he's either smashed things at home or either... He has uh, spoiled somebody, something. So we now had that struggle to get the mental health team to help us. But the, the, the frustration was when you reach, when you tried and got either to a mental institution, he spoke so well that actually you, th you seem to be the ones with the problem. Mm -hmm. So they, they would send my mother and the people back home. And then he comes back and does the same thing. So it went over for quite a while. And then um, what makes me sad about, made me sad about it, it reached a point he took a um, metal rod and hit my eldest brother in the back. So it went the way it shouldn't have been. It had to go to get for a P3, get into the police, have him arrested and and him, I think he ended up in prison for a little while. And then from there is when he got the mental health support he needed. Wow. So while he took his medication, 
everything was fine at home. It was nice. It was perfect. But when he didn't take the medications properly, it was unpredictable. Possibly he has taken off his clothes. Possibly he's gone walking and you don't even know where to find him. So that was the sort of environment. So consequently, as a child, you become the stigma in the school. Children are laughing at you. You become also, um, it's the stigma as well, the fact that I was doing so well in school. And they were saying, what's the point? Where are you going with these good marks? You're not going anywhere. So there's, you know, there's no point in you working hard. But I always relayed the messages to my mother who always said, where you are is not your final station. Work hard and things will change. So I sort of rubbed whatever they said. I just ignored it and worked hard. It so, sounds like your, your mother was a very strong woman. What was your mother like? That, I mean, just that, inf- that, that advice sounds very powerful. Like on the side, she was very strong for all of you. She was very strong because she had been through adversity as well. Ah. Being born, her mother died when she was born. So she never lived to see her mother or know what it meant to be brought up by her natural mother. Mm-hmm. So in that process with consequently growing up, she had a lot of issues, but she always said it is her resilience that made her stand out and continue to focus. So when she spoke to us, she always said, don't let people tell you that your circumstances determine who you will be. Always work hard and aim higher and leave things to unfold as your life goes on. Powerful. And how many siblings were you? How many kids were you at home? We were eight, but uh, one passed away in childhood. So the ones who grew up, we were seven. But unfortunately, I think maybe I can, say, I can say in the words of Oprah Winfrey, she says, challenges are a gift that cause us to find a new center of gravity. Okay. Do not fight them. Just find a new way to stand. So that's what I've been doing all my life. Because besides my father having the mental health problem, my brother also followed. So we had two of them. And then in the process, my brother was murdered. And then at the moment, actually, my parents plus the four siblings, because I'm the fifth born in front of me, have all passed on. Oh my the last one being this year. So it's made me now to be there. <laughs> so when we talk about grief <laughs> and thinking about your transitioning into that being your focus and your, your passion to support other people through grief, you have lived this in every core of your being, right? So you talk about being a child and losing a sibling. Yeah. So that was the first person. Is that right? Um, yeah, my first, uh, my first contact in the family with the grief was the mother of my brother. How old was he? That was when my brother had come up and made our family sort of financially now stable. He was supporting us. We are trying to be uh, out of the poverty we were in. So it's like you are only light being blown out. So our, and, Oh my goodness, you're only light being blown out. So you're already yes. trying to survive from your father being unable to support you. Yes. So you're not being able to go to school, right, anymore. Yeah. Your, your yeah. hopes and your dreams. And then you've got the community, the environment of children sort of bullying you and t- saying you'll never amount to anything. Why, do, why even try? You've got yeah. your mom's strong voice, right? And finally, your brother is old enough, I guess, to earn a living and help to support the family. And then he's murdered. Yes. I mean, what a shock. And so now your world is turned upside down again. It did. It did. And uh, it did for two reasons. One, the fact that that's the first contact with me seeing a close family member die, but also because of our community regulations, community uh, taboos, when you are murdered or when you commit suicide, it's considered a natural death, a, a cast death. So you are literally buried unceremoniously to start off with. Then um, you don't get closure. You don't get you don't get that kind of uh, ritual closure. No, right. 
no, of course you are not allowed to mourn. Normally in our African funerals, we mourn, we grieve, we scream, we sing Christian songs, but all that is not allowed. So there was total silence. During the night, we always, because there are so many people who come, you light a big fire and people warm to the fire and others will be singing. That was not allowed. So it was total physical darkness as well. And then you, you're, you're a child. Were you angry about this or was it just so you knew that this was your culture? So it was normal. But were you angry that you couldn't have a ritual or, or something for your brother? And then, uh, well, it was surprised because I, I grew up knowing people are buried night, daytime. But my brother now, because of the circumstances, he couldn't, when they brought the body from the mortuary, he was straight to the grave. And that was at night. Because wow. there was some problems with the transport. So he was buried at night. And the fact that by the time his church people were, were arriving from the city in the morning, he was already buried. So I was angry at the community. I was angry at the fact that they didn't consider that grieving is not about the dead. It's about those who are living, coming to terms with their loss. And that seemed to be not there. And I just felt the community was insensitive, whoever brought the rules, because literally you can't trace who did it. No, of course, just, of course. I just told this is how it is supposed to be, yeah. and this is how it is supposed to be. So that brought me into wondering and questioning community practices. But, but you don't have a, a, the language at the time, it sounds like. To, no. To, you know, so you, you're holding it. It's kind of buried in somewhere. And this is your first experience. How did it change your family, your mom losing her son and, and the, the, the finances that were coming in from your brother? To be honest, my mother practically, to start off, she was emotionally crushed because this happened in a school uh, compound. I think when he was coming from my grandmother's to our home, then whatever happened, I'm not quite sure. Then he was into, in, went into a school compound and the school children actually stoned him. So by the time my mother arrived, she did describe seeing his brain oozing out when she reached the spot. And she just said, she told him, son, rest in peace. And she came back. So when she was relaying to us, she, her world was so there was um, a part, fallen apart into that because of the circumstances surrounding the death, then the culture that we couldn't mourn, and then of course the financial loss that now this person had steadied the family and had gone. But she always said, trust in God. Wow. It is well with our souls. Wow. It shall be well. So we did... I would say we all died. Of course. Something died in us. You lose something. And I do now, um, I do relate with the, I think it's Norman Cousins, who says the greatest loss, death is not the greatest loss of life. The greatest loss is what dies inside us while we live. So at that particular time, time I think we all changed and we were never the same something died in each of us it would and what we can tend to do is we start putting walls up right to protect our heart and protect us from feeling right yes um, and it can affect maybe how our relationships how we trust people it, like you said something dies and changes in our perspective on the world right and we have, now you know a lot more about grief. We have choices about what we do with that, right? Yeah. Um, so before we go, because I'm very curious about your views on how the hell do you survive this stuff, right? But just talk us through, you, you've, you've lost some more family members. Like what, was, what happened next over the years? Um, that time when my brother died, actually he had gone to take my father to hospital. So three, time, three months later, my father died. Okay. And... When my father died, my brother's wife, my late brother's wife was pregnant. She delivered that day. Three months later, the child died. 
Oh. I was um, pregnant at the time, so I was up and down. It was the days before the mobile phones, and then you had to go. Diff- this infrastructure with traveling was quite hard. I was also pregnant and got malaria, got into premature labor, and I also lost a three ma- three days baby. So it just escalated. But at my brother's... Um, and then after that, of course, I lost my firstborn sister, my brother, and the last born sister, I lost her January this year. And I've also lost significant, two significant friends, um, one in 2015, one last year. And this year, my sister was the third person because all those people, we had plans of what we are going to do about our community. And then it just all went smashed. So there's a ripple effect. Yeah, and so... The parallel of this, so on the side of this, you're studying. So you, because you didn't have money coming into your house. So how the hell are you kind of focusing on teaching, but then nursing at the same time as some of this is happening? Well, when all this was happening, our firstborn two sisters, they didn't, the ones I was saying, they didn't make it beyond primary school. They started working as house girls or maids. Mm -hmm. So they put the rest of us into education. Okay, wow. With whatever they were giving, they would give to my mother and she would keep it and save it and work and add on a bit and take us to school. And my uncle also supported my father's brother when we reached the end and we could go and he would top it up for us. But when they brought us up also they too had their own stigma as well people were laughing at them and saying you are stupid girls you've not gone beyond sec- you've not gone to secondary school and you're spending your life working and putting others through secondary school what what are you doing so they just said well it is our personal affairs it's our choice to help so we are helping our family so it's it's fine with us and so that's how we went through. It's when they helped us, they helped my brother. So we came through and I was also lucky because when I finished Form 4 with their help and my uncle's help, I got into a school where we didn't have to pay. Okay. So I was able to do my nursing without paying the, the fees. school fees. Mm-hmm. And I was also able to support my two others who are behind me and my nieces. So I took over from my elder sisters and said, now for what you've done, I'll carry on. And we've supported one another like that. So my mother just said, when you are successful, remember to help others. And that's what I I try to do. (laughs) Your mother has had a great influence on your life, hasn't she? She did. She did. Yeah. So, I mean, you've listed so, so much heartbreak and so much loss. Were there times in your life where you just felt like you couldn't go on? like the grief was so unbearable that you thought it would, that you just couldn't move forward? Well, I I think I've had those three, on three occasions I've had my rock bottom times. The first one was with my brother's death because it really crushed me until physically and emotionally. And at that particular point, I told myself one thing, I was going to search out for what can help our family, whatever it costed me. So from that perspective, I now went, um, when I went for my midwifery, I met a friend and I explained to her what had happened. And she told me, come on, I'll tell you what we we do. Let's go for, there um, there was a church program. It used to be called healing, counseling, and um, marriage. So, she took me there and that program really helped me and rooted me in the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. So from my brother's death, I got my strong Christian faith through that. I went through that program. They just taught things. So whether you are actively affected or whether you are there as somebody to support others going through the situations, you are all in the same group. So from that I was able now to support many other people with the whatever I have help I'd found. I was also able to found, find more resilience in life that, you know, in spite of what is going on, 
there is still hope. There is still grounds to cover. Just keep moving. And so from there, what I would say, besides that now getting into touch with that um, ministry, in that process, that pastor one time was just teaching and said, who wants to join my mission of helping broken homes, marriages, and all that. And I put up my hand <laughs> as I, without knowing the consequences. Yeah. So from that effect, in, in that day, everywhere I go, be it at the airport, anywhere, people are asking me about things about marriage. And I could look at myself and think, this person is older than me. What do they think they're asking, you know? But now, um, I think 2013, I put all the common questions and everything into a book and I called it Marriage, Why Bother? So that was... <laughs> I love that title. <laughs> I need to read that book. <laughs> I'm asking myself that question. <laughs> so that was a product of Through That Rock Bottom. That was one of the things I did. And then also... From that, I also now looked out for other grievers because I felt grievers were not heard or listened to because people are just quick to tell you what not to do and what to do, but they didn't want to know how you are. Mm, just listen, create space. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so, but then I just want to highlight the point. So in surviving that grief, there was something about your faith, your Christian faith. So yes. Yes. Hope but also giving back pretty much immediately, uh, learning some things to ground yourself and then supporting other people. It sounds like it gave some purpose to the, to the adversity, to losing your brother, to the, the, the rock bottom that you experienced. It did. It did because it, 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 made, it made me look beyond. And even also... Besides that, I also got to that level where I felt there are times when people see things coming. Maybe you are, somebody is sick and they're not really going to recover and they hide the truth. But I decided the other way around. I decided if you see, you start telling people, you know, things are not going right here. What do you do? What can you do? And from that perspective, I do meet people who say, you know, you remember you helped us because it helped either the person who was going to die, they had a time to change things around when they could, and those who are there also to adjust and do things. And one of the things that I do tell people is that, you know, all these things we hide, sometimes it's when they come together as a big impact, but if you had little, little truth, and you are adjusting gradually, the impact is not as drastic as when you just get, when you think everything is together. Yes. And, and then you are just you. dropped yeah. a bombshell when people yeah. knew it, about it up six months ago. Yeah. It's but something you could do. have salvaged. We hide how we're feeling, right? And yeah. we, we pretend it's not there, or we maybe distract ourselves with whatever alcohol, uh, you know, distractions. Uh, and then it's building up over time, and then it feels like it explodes, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah. So, so if we can tackle it uh, in small ways and be honest, down, it, it, then we're managing smaller problems than rather than a big one. Yeah. Yeah. And so, Absolutely. so that was one of your rock bottoms. What were the other two? I'm curious now. Um, my second one was my health. Your health. Okay. So, you, yes. are you already working as a nurse? When, what, yeah, yeah. yeah so you're working yeah. as a nurse. You're helping so many people, right? You're giving back. You're supporting your family. What yeah. happened with your health? Um, what happened with my health in 2008? I just wasn't feeling right. And no particular, I couldn't put a particular reason or a particular thing anywhere that I'm not feeling well. So I it bothered me for a while and I went to the doctors and I explained. So the doctors did the tests and when they finished, um, the, the doctor looked at me and he asked me, are you taking any medications? I asked him, what sort of medications? Oh, so he said, are you taking like medications which are having impact on your immunity, whether it, is it cancer treatment? I said, well, I'm not on any medication at all. Hmm. So he said, okay, um, your blood tests are not good. 
so what we are going to do, I'm going to repeat them and I'm going to send you to a hematologist, refer you to a hematologist. So with my nursing knowledge, that already told me he's thinking, of course, there must be something, something not right with my blood. So that is like cancer of the blood or things like that. And so I, I say to him, what, what exactly is it? So he just, he just explained, no, the way your blood looks, they, it is like either people who are immunosuppressed or people who are like having chemotherapy drugs and that. And um, so that message just crushed me because when I left the house, I didn't tell my husband where I was going. I just left and went. And when I came back home, I just sat on the chair and I just started crying. Because mm. I've seen what happens to the patient, so I know the, pretty right. like the process. I've had friends who have gone that way. And I, actually, when I was seeing my symptoms, I could think of some of the friends that I've lost. And I was thinking, this seems like what so-and-so had. So that one, I... I came and I did cry for three days mm -hmm. and I just felt my heart, my life was in pieces. And I was saying, I've worked so hard. I've supported so many people, but I've not made any, you know, I've not made any foundation for my own children. So if this is my end, what, what, what happens to my children? Uh, how how many my, children do you have by then? Three. You have three children. Okay. Yeah, I'd already lost one. So I was thinking, how will my children yeah. be? How will my husband be? Because, because of the family circumstances, we were more into helping others and helping others. So I came back and um, that Sunday, I am the person who always says you are going to church. But that particular Sunday, I said, I'm not going to church. And my husband said, we are going to church. Mm -hmm. So we reached the church, and as we entered the church, this, this song was being sung, when your heart's broken and you feel alone. So those words just hit me as I walked through, and I thought, yes, my heart is broken. I feel alone. And when I went and sat down, they, they just gave testimonies. You know, people come to say, like, the adversity, what has happened to them. And somebody came and said, uh, I'm here to say um, about 22 years now, at the age of three, I had problems and my parents were told that's the end. There is nothing more the doctors could do. So the parents took her to the altar and just prayed and said they've left her in God's hands. And she was saying, and I'm here to say I'm pregnant, I'm 23 years old. And I said, well, that is saying something to me. Okay. So that gave something. But then when I went to work, the first person <laughs> I met, she tells me, oh, I was told I've got this condition. And it's the best thing that happened to me. <laughs> so I was like, what? She said, yeah, it's the best thing that happened to me. So I said, oh, tell me more. Yes, she said, why? You know, since I got it, I started living. Before, I was just, you know, I, I, just, I was just existing. Mm -hmm. But now I know the value of life. Wow. Now I know that this life is limited, so you need to do things. Mm. And she was telling me she had had the condition for about five years. And what she has done in five years is more than what she had not done in her 40 plus years. Goodness. So, so her whole perspective changes. Yeah, so my perspective changed with her, her message. But then I also had my church people, we call it cell group. So they used to say, oh, don't worry about all that. We are going to pray about it. Just tell us when you are going, we pray about your blood. We pray about the test. Mm -hmm. And we did that for about three months. Then the doctor said, uh, carried on for six months. And then he asked, was that actually your blood test or not? I said, I don't know. So that ended. So then you were fine. And then I just carried on. And what I did also, that also helped me into looking into foods that would improve your immunity. What else could you do? I bumped into a, a newspaper that I don't normally read, I just a, a magazine. And behind it, 
somebody said she had, um, I think she had cancer of somewhere. And then she was told by her grandmother, exercise cures. You exercise and the body, the endorphins help and your body knows how to recover. So she started, I think she said she started her exercises in her 60s. Wow. And in her 80s, she was, she was doing active running and everything was fine. So I incorporated exercise in my life. So literally, I just saw that particular time. I saw total darkness. And I called it, I started living again. So I started now counting my age from there. So when I meet people in such stages, I tell them, you know what? I don't look at the past. I look at where I'm going. What are you going to do with the remaining time? It could be one day you're better than somebody who just collapsed and died. It could be five days. What are you going to do? So when I meet people and I tell them like that, they say, oh, we always focus on what we've lost. We never think about what is before us. Yeah. So that helped me also to relate with people and tell them that losses are painful. We grieve our loss, but let's embrace what is remaining. What can we do with it? How can we better it? Because health is about also managing your limitations and your disability. So that is how that. that rock bottom brought me. <laughs> wow. And did that influence your ability to say no? knowing that you had to nurture your own body and invest in yourself? By then, I'd already known saying yeah. no. So I, was, I actively used it and people think I overused it sometimes. <laughs> no. <laughs> no I, I love what uh, I heard a line that said, no is a full sentence. Because yes. Do you, have you heard that one? Sometimes we I've think, had. oh, I say no, but I have to give you a long list of why. And so, no, we don't have to. Sometimes no. it's just, it, we just need to invest in ourselves. Yeah. Um, Wow. So, did so? Are you saying that that rock bottom kind of just shifted your own perspective and on, on on how you chose to live your life rather it than did. what you thought? Amazing. And it so, did. what was your what was your third rock bottom? Let's go to all of them. <laughs> <laughs> There's such good lessons in each and every one. <laughs> my my third rock bottom, my third rock bottom, as as you've had me say, I was planning that in future I would. I would do things in, for the community and I would do it with the two friends that I lost and my sister. So those were my three pillars. Mm. So they were three because I'm not a proactive, you know, I'm not outspoken. They are outspoken people. So I'm normally like underground person who does things underground and then the ones who are the visible people mm -hmm. organizing. So what happened was when they have all gone. I felt like every chip being taken away and taken away. And finally, when my sister passed, I just thought, you know, my retirement plans have gone all to the bean. Because mm. the people I focused on to manage and do things with are not there. Wow. So I asked myself, what can I learn from this? What can I do? Wait, Number wait, one. Wait, wait, let me stop you. When, uh, when could you ask yourself that? Because you know, people who are listening who may have lost somebody close to them, right? They yeah. That you're just, sometimes you're destroyed first. Sometimes you're lost, right? You're, you, you, you don't know, but, but you're asking yourself, what can I learn from this? Did you need a bit of distance from the grief in order to even ask yourself that question? Or have you been through it so many times, you know, that you just know that that's the question you've got to ask yourself quickly? No, I would say having gone through many griefs, every grief is, is unique. Okay. That's and good. you that's grieve it differently. Yeah. And so we say every loss is unique. And, you, and that's why we say we don't compare losses. Oh, so, that's so profound. Yeah. So some peop, sometimes I asked questions immediate. Other times it was after. So there was no specific Got it. time I asked for my, the questions. But now when it was all done and my sister had also gone, so I was thinking now I've got three things to deal with. I've got all my family under me yeah. and 
because our parents went earlier and those who are earlier, we have many kids. So I don't even know who to say I am if people ask me. <laughs> because yeah, yeah, yeah. one time I'm an auntie, I'm a mother-in-law, I'm, we take all the positions and cover them for ourselves. Yeah. So if our nieces or needed anything, we stand in my mother's gap, we stand in our own gap and like that. So yeah. I had yeah. that and then I had the connections with my friends, which they had and how do I reach and do what we could have done together. And then my sister, now, what I now reached, I told myself is that possibly these people were in my life for an example. What have I learned from them? I need to be more public. Yeah. So I, I've started working on that. <laughs> Well, this is a good step. This is a public platform. <laughs> yes, um, I've started going to the Toastmaster so that I improve my public speaking and I improve my confidence. Nice. Then I've started looking at the fact that these people had platforms. So in essence, they have actually built foundations for me. Mm -hmm. So I've got networks that I would not have had if they were not in my life. Mm -hmm. And so I've decided to look at it and say, I shall tap into the networks they have made for me. That is where part of them would be found. So that's how I've tackled <laughs> that that way. And then on the other aspect now, I have to look and see how else can I help the ones I have to be over. So I just had to get them round and say, now we need to do this and do that and do that. But then now this was the point that tipped me completely into the grief recovery the fact that grievers are not hard and every grief is different so when i had already booked myself for the course grief recovery method is a program that has been running in the uk for the last 10 years but 30 years in the us okay so carol henderson who is the managing director of Grief Recovery UK, lost her husband and her world went apart. So she went to the US to get that and get into support. So she started it here. So when I spoke to her in my process of making my, my presentation for the Toastmasters, mm -hmm. I realized it actually is what I've been doing, but it, there was now more logic to how to do it. Yeah. and a better way of doing it than I'd done. Yeah. And so that now tipped me to even know more the fact that we are grievers in different ways, but sometimes we don't know. And particularly from my personal perspective, like the loss of my brother, that's when I realized I didn't really grieve him because I was annoyed with the community, I was annoyed with the circumstances, but I never actually grieved him. So we had one question which was asking if your loved one, maybe if they committed suicide or if they have been murdered or died in mysterious circumstances, if they died in a different way, would you miss them any less? And I thought, no, of course not. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, that had completely blocked me from grieving him. So I still had, when I was, I've got a book I was writing and I reached that stage that where, and I just, talked about it tears came and that's where it stopped <laughs> so you so I, you you grieved your brother much later when so you gave yourself I, permission yeah so i i realized that i put the the anger and the things you know like when people say we are looking for justice and we are doing this that is fine but after you get the justice the grief process is not done you need to start it if you have to move so for somebody who's in a similar situation Yes. Um, and they blocked the grief. And now it's many years later. How do they start grieving? What do, what do they do? And I know every grief is different, but is there any advice on how they start grieving? Because sometimes you block yourself off so much that you don't even know where to start. Actually, that's what the whole process, the grief recovery method process is all about. Because it defines for you grief, that grief is the... Is the either the loss, the end, or any change in your natural change 
in your natural behavior. Okay. So when you have anything that has interrupted, that means you are grieving. It could be a positive thing, like you are retired and then you've lost all your friends. So one thing you are happy, you are not going to work, you have time to do other things, and then the consequence. So we say in grief recovery that grief is not only the negative things, mm -hmm. it's also the positive things. But the most important thing to mark is the whatever you've been doing, your normal routine, whatever has caused a pause or an end. So when we define the grief, we now tell people, what do we grieve about? Why do we grieve? We are grieving because we wish things were better. Mm -hmm. That means if things were not good, or if things were good, we wish we could have more of that. Yeah. So that in itself brings us what we grieve about. And so grief is the conflicting feelings you have after your loss. Wow, and that's okay. Because sometimes and that's okay to grieve. Guilty. They feel guilty if they have the, the maybe the positive feelings after somebody passes. Exactly. Right. right. So, okay. So we tell them it's those conflicting feelings. And for instance, on one aspect, if I used like my like when I lost my sister, one aspect I could say, I wish she was still there. Then the other aspect I could say, I'm glad that the way she's been suffering with the illness, I wouldn't have liked her to mm -hmm. continue suffering, but it's still the same thing. But yeah. you see, it's the same way you feel. So we tell people that the fact that you've lost somebody does not mean you can't be happy about anything at all. No, even in that grief, if something comes about to laugh, you laugh about it. You join it because people tell you, oh, I feel so awful that I I was celebrating this or I was laughing and this has happened. So he say, no, that is normal. What we are saying in grief, the main problem is we need to allow people to grieve, put the emotions back into grief because it's an emotional journey. Mm -hmm. So we can't use logic to deal with it. You have that's to feel, what society feel the feelings. Whatever, feel the feelings, if they're positive, negative, whatever. And many things can be true at once. Sometimes yes. we want to be in one extreme. I feel like I should mourn or be sad for the next week, three months, one year, whatever it is. And any kind of joy, we feel a bit like, ooh, guilty about that. So yeah. it's okay to hold many emotions. Um, what about the importance of ritual? Do you think that it is, I obviously know, knowing how the, the experience with your brother, um, but, but equally in the other circumstances of death that maybe weren't um, sort of, that had that stigma attached to it, do you think the grief process, that it's really important, to, whether you're Christian or not Christian, to have some kind of ritual that, rem that helps you remember the person? Yeah, I do, I do, I do believe the, the rituals are there. So people have different rituals. Mm -hmm. And those rituals, if you look in the reasons behind them, Actually, you find that some of the rituals, some of them you could do away with, but some of them are good. Because, for instance, in my culture, besides the, the, the ones of where they consider it's a normal grief, we have the fact that if somebody died, you can all come and scream the whole place down. And when you come, everybody supports you. As you come, others come and support you. So by the time... You have your three days mourning, and that time you just mourn. You can cry as much as you want. Everybody joins you. You can sing. You can do everything with nobody hindering you. So you have that process. By the time you are getting to the barrio, you are, you are anger levels. You are all those uh, negative emotions. You've been releasing gradually. Mm -hmm. So by the time we bury, then we have that occasion which seemingly surprising that you actually feel fearful now. It's your home you are used to, but now you, you are fearful even of staying in your home. So we have it like in my culture, we have people don't live after the burial. Not all people live at the same time. Close relatives and close friends will remain. And then the rest of the family members start going little by little, so that you don't leave all at a go. So it's gradual. Gradual. So it's gradual release 
of yes. more of grief, but also gradual support system kind yeah. of giving you and, a space. Yes, and then they have the time they come back as well to visit and see how you are getting on, and then people keep in touch like that. But then, in contrast, because I've lived in England yes. now for a while, yes. <laughs> sometimes you don't even realize your neighbor died. No, yes, there's, no, there's a lack of community. But even when you know people, people find it very difficult to talk about grief, I think, and to talk about death and to talk about the person who is no longer there. It's a very awkward, maybe, uh, conversation here. Yeah, so I found it quite difficult. And even when people have done or have been through grief, so because it's my passion, I really... I, I just ask what's the person's number and get in touch and, and tell them, find out. And then they say, this is how it is. But the, I tell them that you see in grief recovery, they say, we have tools which we were handed over by the community, which were faulty. They may have worked in those days, considering the times they were in. Yeah. But at the moment, they talk of myths which people are perpetuating. They say one of the myths is we say grieve alone. Mm. So in grieve alone, it means I can write a card and put through the door and say, Petra, if you do need me, please call me. Yeah. And also because of that, this griever now subsequently lacks confidence because now they've been isolated from the people. So it becomes hard for them to reach to the people. And then because people don't know how to handle them, with their grief, yeah. they avoid them. So it becomes a yeah. compound problem. Yes, yes. Avoiding the issue, it actually doesn't help the release of grief, I think, because people no, it are doesn't. More, more alone, right? Yeah. Uh, and like, it's really hard to think about the lesson or the good stuff when you're alone and don't have an outlet for your grief. Yes. And then the other thing we say also when people talk about replace the loss, they talk about it such... For instance, um, somebody's relationship has gone sour and they're saying, oh, Petra, don't worry, you'll get another one. Yes, yes. Let your fish in the sea. Oh, yes. It's not Petra, helpful. <laughs> it, it's not helpful because the person is not grieving that they're lost, they're plenty. The person is grieving because of their emotional attachment to the lost object or person. That is what is causing them pain. So, so go ahead. We need to allow them to feel the pain and not hinder them by telling them, replace the loss. The loss is not the same. Even if you remarried, you have to deal with the past relationship if you have to succeed in the next one. Absolutely, absolutely. So if, if somebody is, one of our listeners is a friend, so they're not a grief counselor, so they don't have as much experience as you, but they are a friend of the person who has lost someone. Yes. What advice would you give them? What are some things that they can say that would be helpful for this person, especially here in this culture? What you can say is I've just come. I've heard you've lost this and this or this has happened to you and I've come just to support you. And sometimes you actually don't need to say anything. So you, once you, give, you say that, you allow them to talk without interrupting without analyzing or criticizing. Because when you're grieving, it's like when you are emotionally unstable, what you say may not make sense, even when you think about it yourself. So the person is to be aware that this person is not in their normal self and just listen to give them the outlet. And it's funny how hard people find that. It's, it it's, is. So, it's so simple. Just create space and just say, you know, um, echo, like repeat back how they're feeling. That must be so difficult. Can I yes. make you some tea? Can I help you in the house? Let's go for a walk. Just your presence with the person is enough. But people feel like they need to have the answers, don't they? And so they avoid it because they're like, oh, I don't have the answers in this situation. True. And that's why they say that that being there in itself and just allowing them to go through the emotions most of the time you'll get people saying you supported them. And when you think you didn't say anything, yes. but it's that privilege of them being able to offload what was under, what was putting them under pressure. And the other thing is the fact that what people say is, I've been through it. This has happened. 
that is not acceptable because what we are doing is you are changing the attention from the griever to yourself. So wait, wait, wait. I, I understand, but also you have been you have been through it very yes. specifically many, many, many times. Yes. So do, you, do you ever with a person say, I've been through it and I really understand, or is it is it never useful? I used to do that, but now after the grief recovery training, I understand it's not useful because this griever, every loss is unique. Every relationship is unique. So this griever needs to grieve their grief 100%. So what I need not to about you. Yeah. allow the griever to get through their emotions, talk about their loss, because this is what is at stake at the moment. Okay. And then when they're over that, we can now talk about my example later. Got it. So it's timing. Yeah. It's being sensitive to the situation and realizing that every grief is different. So even if you've been through it, you can't just say, oh, this is what it's like and this is what I did, so this will work for you. You have yeah. to just remain open. Yeah? Yes. Um, Dorothy, you're so inspirational and beautiful and special. Um, I've, I have learned a lot just sitting in this conversation with you. Um, I have two final questions. So first of all, if people want to connect with you, if they want to reach out, learn more about the grief recovery process, how can they find you? And your books, you've written books. How do they find <laughs> those? Yes. <laughs> uh, just before I answer your question, one more thing I would say to those who are supporting grievers or those yeah. who are going go through the grief, don't tell somebody you understand what they're going through because nobody does. Oh, God, right? You yeah. don't know what they're going through and you don't understand. You can only tell them, I can imagine, because that's the truth. You can only imagine. That's such good advice because people, that's what they try. And not just, we're talking about grief, but this could be around mental health issues, um, divorce, uh, losing a child, like all the, the life stuff that is difficult. When we say we understand, we, also, we actually push people away in a way. Cause, because it's more useful to say, I, imagine, I can only imagine how hard that is. Tell me more. What's it like for you, right? Yeah, so you, you, that then gives them the ability to be able to say without you interrupting. And also just a final thing I'll say before I answer your last question. We also grieve positive things, and that is one area where people don't realize, and therefore we lose people to the opposite side. For instance, uh, when we get married, you are happy, you are going to a new relationship, you are happy, but you are sad about losing these relationships you've been in for 30 years, 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so there's something underneath that when you're trying to tell people, they're saying, oh, can't you see you got married? Can't you see this has happened? And similarly, people could also grieve for positive things like you've been praying, like me, I would possibly be praying my children to be successful and move on. When they move on, you have an emptiness, you start grieving. Yes. You get promoted, you've got new things to learn, you've got to lose the people you are used to, you are grieving in a form. You are happy, you've got a new house, you're moving home, you're yeah. grieving. Wow, this is so, I really needed to hear this. Um, you, you've got a baby. Yes. It's nice to have a baby, but it has an impact on your health. Mm -hmm. you are, you'll no longer be the same the way you are. So you are grieving about that. You are also grieving about the things that has happened. But nobody wants to realize that, though it's a good, a good event. I, must, is, I, I, I imagine you felt that when you moved to the UK. You thought, I did. Yes, I'm, yeah. I have a bright future. Maybe it will be better for my children, excitement. And I'm grieving my culture and everyone I know, And right? Yeah, I did. Yes. I did, I certainly did. So also positive things just to bear in mind that people can grieve and parents, when children come to tell us things, what they did in school, what happened, we should listen and not tell them you could have been better, you could have been this, because they're also having their way. They just need to somebody to hear them. So if we learn to just listen and probably give advice later, then they'll be able to be coming and telling us what's happening. Then when we shut, because they'll say, I know what mom will say or dad. Yes, yes. I imagine yeah. your children are very proud of you. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So back to your question, Petra. I have now, st- I am now starting my dot grief company, which okay. I'll be starting in Liverpool. So I'm now starting it. Uh, I'll be putting up the things up. So hopefully in the new year, people will be able to get me on the social media before the year ends. Okay. And um, I am in Liverpool, but uh, at the moment, I still um, I still carry on with my passion. So if people want to get in touch with me before the end of the week, they can get through Dot Grief Company. Dot Grief Company. We'll we'll put that into the the show notes. And my final, final question, because this yes. is way too exciting. I know I said 40 minutes, but I'm just like, I could talk to Dorothy all morning. Um, <laughs> I, and this is, I'm curious about this for me. So you, you're a helper, you're a giver on so many levels. You're so passionate and ambitious. You have children, you have your nursing, you have your grief stuff, right? Your books. I mean, the school, you, you just do so many things. You've learned how to- I also how to- sing. Do you sing? I'm a oh. singer. I've got two albums. Love you. Look at you with all your. Dif- You're definitely living for everyone you've lost, aren't you? You're like I will. And you at Toastmasters. You're doing public speaking. You're like you're, you're living for everyone. I can really see the the impact for you. How do you look after yourself? I mean, singing is probably a good one. But what are the ways that you invest in yourself so that you can give out at the level that you give out? One thing I believe in what Patrice Washington says, take care of the vessel that will be there to execute your vision. Oh, I love so that. I deposit in myself. I do, I, I, I like singing as, as you say, I'm, I'm a singer. So I sing, mm-hmm. I do um, one mile walk on YouTube with, with Leslie Sanson. I go through her to her videos, dancing and inspiring people who are saying they don't have time to use 15 minutes to do one mile exercise. I am normally an active person, so I could walk about two to three miles every day. Okay. And also I have groups, different groups of women groups, different groups of things I belong to, church groups, um, different activities. So those are sort of recreational activities and we go on holidays with other people other than my family. Mm-hmm. I also do things with my family because part of what makes me who I am is the family support. The support I've had from my husband and my children mm-hmm. when I'm doing these things. So I always value the family support and also tell people that please take care of your relations now. Don't wait when things are bad or don't wait to give them flowers when they are gone. Give them flowers when they are alive so that they can receive the flowers and enjoy the scent from the flowers. So, and then I also join other women network. That's where I met with Ngoiti. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. Who introduced us? Yeah, lovely. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. So you, 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 you obviously love people and um, re- building relationships. And I love what you're saying is in investing your relationships now, because yeah. so many of us are we take it for granted. We just work, or we we don't think about it, and then we start having problems, and then we go, oh my goodness, we should do counseling, or or maybe it's the end, or whatever. So in, invest in the people around you because that's the support network that lifts you up as well when when the tough times come, right? It does, it does, because it's, it's what holds you. If you have nobody, then you just, the, the darkness becomes even more. <laughs> yeah, and, <laughs> and people can pull isolate. you up. Absolutely. And in this culture, I'm in, Lo- I'm in London, you're in Liverpool, uh, in the city often, uh, people end up isolating themselves and just locking their doors and um, you, you know, being alone. So, so reach out to the people around you. But equally, if you're the person in grief, if you've invested in your relationships, right, during while you're while you're doing okay, those are the people that then reach out to you. And also, even if you didn't reach out, possibly you've not been reaching out. There's always a starting point. Lovely. You could start from there, and uh, just to 
mention one thing. I think you mentioned about alcohol and things that you do to cover yourself. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Um, those things uh, in grief recovery, they call them stabs, short energy releasing behaviors. Wow. Yeah. What happens is it's the behavior that when you are so distressed under pressure, you think, what will I do? You not fail to get any amicable things. So you say, maybe I'll try drugs, maybe I'll try smoking. Maybe some people become promiscuous. Maybe others is overeating or undereating or un over exercise. So what those behaviors do, they make you feel different, but not better. Yes. So because you are looking to feel different, you try it again and then you keep going. Mm -hmm. So when you get people, I always tell people that you can, we can also help each other by realizing something is not right with Petra. Something is happening. Bring it to her attention. And when you look at it, when you see people changing, there's always some story behind it, some trauma behind it. But until you sort out the root cause of the behavior, you can't actually just tell them to stop the behavior. Okay, so it isn't just stop. Um, there, so sometimes we need to have compassion that those, those behaviors are just trying to help us feel different because what we're going through is too difficult. Yes. But gradually or eventually, we should be thinking about doing other things instead to, to lift us up. <laughs> Actually, those, those behaviors, we end up in them because we didn't have support. But if right. we had support and we, we also looked for support, that would, we would not really have gone that way. But when you meet people, like if I meet people, when they just tell me things, I always ask, when did you start this? And they always go to when they started. So you realize that it's like if you're telling somebody, for example, they are now alcoholic you are telling them you need to stop taking alcohol because of this, this, and this, and this health reasons. But they still have the cause, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the root cause of why they the drink. That they're trying to cover. Yeah, so yeah. they're not going to expose. They, so they have to deal with that root cause first before right. they now get to this behavior. So in life, there's nobody who has gone beyond. It is salvaging what you have start thinking about what can I do to change myself? Because until you take personal responsibility, all the information and everything people do makes no sense. And that's where we're going to end. Yes. Personal responsibility, people. There's the information is out there. The people are out there. We can reach out and get the support, but also practice some self-compassion that if you are in those behaviors that Dorothy describes, um, that sometimes we, rather than saying no, no more of those behaviors, we can start introducing small things, maybe the walks or talking to somebody. Like two things, many things can be true at once, sadness and joy. We can hold many different emotions at the same time, which is an important thing for us to recognize. We can have negative coping mechanisms and we can introduce positive coping mechanisms, right? And that yes. over time, uh, things will change. Uh, what was the quote you said that your mother used to tell you? That everything will change, I think you said, something like that, do you remember? Right yes. at the beginning, yeah, it was very <laughs> profound. So any emotional state will evolve into something else over time. We need to practice patience and ask ourselves when we're ready, what can we learn from this grief and from the people and the richness of the memories that they have left behind. Thank you so much, Dorothy, for all oh, your wisdom and your inspiration and your time. We really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you very much, Petra. It's been my joy to reach the maximum people in the shortest time and you've given me the opportunity. Thank you so much. 